Hello and welcome to chapter four for nutrition and meal planning. So in this chapter we're going to look all about carbohydrates and what are carbohydrates even? Uh, you know, you see all the bread and pasta in that picture, which is the first place a lot of people's minds go when they hear the word carbohydrates. Um, but that's not the only source. We get carbohydrates from a lot of our foods in our diet. So we'll talk a little bit about what they are. Hopefully dispel some of the myths. Um, you know, it definitely seems like carbohydrates kind of get a bad rap now. Um, the, you know, fat used to be the enemy. Now, now carbohydrates are the enemy, um, and at least in terms of how it's talked about in popular culture. So in this chapter, we'll learn a little bit about what really are carbohydrates, how do they affect our body, etc. So carbs are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And what it is is it's one or more sugar units or saccharide units put together. Um, they contain four calories per gram. They are a source of fiber in food. They add sweetness and flavor and satisfaction to our food. Um, and in the body, it's our primary source of energy for all of our cells in our body. Um, our brain, red blood cells, and muscles are in ex exercise essentially really prefer blood glucose. Um, fiber especially is very important for our intestinal health. And it can also spare the use of protein for energy because our body can turn protein into our uh, glucose. So it can turn protein into energy. It doesn't necessarily like to do that or prefer to do that, but it can. And so um, sometimes if they're just eating a whole bunch more protein, some protein may get turned into glucose. So we have carbohydrates and we define them as simple or complex carbohydrates. And our simple carbohydrates are short carbohydrates made of one or two sugar units. And so these are color coded. And so the, under the monosaccharides, you can see our three major monosaccharides in our body, which is just one sugar. So glucose is the first one. This is the form of carbohydrate that circulates in our blood. It's also found in fruits, vegetables, and honey. Fructose is also found in fruits, vegetables, and honey, and is another one of our monosaccharides. And then galactose is our third monosaccharide, and that is the one that makes up milk sugar. And then if you go look at our disaccharides, and it is color-coded on that way, so maltose is two glucoses put together. Um, it's really formed as a product of starch digestion, which is just a longer chain of glucose put together. Um, we don't have a, a lot of natural maltose in our foods. Sucrose is what we think of as table sugar. So it's one glucose and one fructose molecule put together. And so if you're adding sugar onto your cereal at the table, that white, that white granulated sugar is sucrose. And then lactose is galactose and glucose put together. And that is uh, only found in milk, yogurt, and other dairy products. So you may have heard of lactose intolerance um, when someone has trouble digesting lactose um, when they consume milk products. So these are our simple carbohydrates. We also have complex carbohydrates, and we consider it an oligosaccharide if it's three to 10 of those monosaccharides linked. Um, and you can see these are a bunch of glucose molecules put together, or a polysaccharide, which has a greater than 10 to thousands of glucose molecules linked. What this is showing you here is a couple different kinds of our polysaccharide. So starch, is the first one, and that's how our our plants, our vegetables, our grains, legumes, et cetera, store their energy. So we have amylose and amylopectin. Those are just two different types. Um, I'm not necessarily that concerned with you identifying the difference between those two, but I do want you to, to realize that those are digestible bonds that come from our plant foods. Then our fiber is, you've probably heard of fiber, and you can see there they're highlighting the difference in that bond shape. I know you have to look really closely to look at the difference in the bond between the amylose and the cellulose over there in the fiber category, but the bond, is, they're just demonstrating it looking different. Uh, we don't have the digestive enzymes to break down fiber. And there are two here, cellulose and hemicellulose, that are shown. Um, and so we cannot break that down. And so we find these in a lot of our plants and they have a lot of, of other health benefits in our body. So we don't technically break down fiber in our digestive system the same way we break down starch. We'll talk more about fiber in a minute. 
Um, glycogen then is the animal primary storage form of glucose. So we don't store a lot of glucose in our body. So excess energy in humans is mostly stored as fat, but we do have some limited uh, glucose stores in the form of glycogen that can be found in either the skeletal muscle or the liver. So that is a very branched uh, molecule. It's so easy for our enzymes to break it down faster that way. So again, glycogen is how animals store glucose and starch is how plants store glucose. And then fiber is something that we're not breaking down, but has a um, important role in overall health, which we'll talk about. So where do we find carbohydrates in food? So again, I showed the bread picture and that's where a lot of people's minds go. Um, you know, I've had people who, you know, come to me, they're really confused what, why they're having blood sugar concerns and they don't, they're stopped eating all bread and their carbohydrates are down, but maybe they're consuming a lot of sugar or some coffee drinks with a lot of sugar or um, you know, a lot of other added sugar foods. So it's not just the bread, but we can see here, um, all we have a lot of different plant foods. Most of our carbohydrates come from plant foods. So our grains, you can see there, um, vegetables, uh, and some vegetables have more carbohydrates than others. Um, fruits, uh, dairy, so milk, yogurt, those have um, carbohydrate in them. And some of our protein foods have a little bit of carbohydrates as well, especially a lot of our legumes. Uh, so you can see that milk and honey are really the only animal sources of carbohydrates, and most of it comes from plants that we eat. So hopefully that gets you some in, insight into where carbohydrates are from and not just bread. So this slide just goes briefly over the process of photosynthesis. And you may have heard, heard about this in you know, earlier science classes that you may have had. And photosynthesis basically captures the light energy to convert the carbon dioxide and water into a three carbon sugar, which can then make fructose or glucose. And plants can then store this as starch. So it's just kind of showing the, the cycle, if you will, and how we then get uh, carbohydrates from our plants that we consume. So what about whole grains? So I want to show you on the next slide a picture of a kernel of wheat so we can look at these essential parts. But essentially a whole grain contains all of the essential parts and we have endosperm, germ, and bran um, or the original grain seed. So basically it hasn't been altered. There haven't been parts that have been removed etc. A refined grain is then a grain that's been milled and removing the bran and germ part of the seed. And so this is whole grain flour versus white flour. And I'll show you what this looks like in a second. Um, enriched grains then is a definition I wanted to share with you. And so that's a grain that was refined, but has certain vitamins and minerals added back in. And so you may see enriched white flour on some of your food labels, because basically it's not a whole grain product. Uh, they removed some of the bran and germ parts but they may have then added some vitamins and minerals back into the food, and so therefore it is that enriched flour that we often see in the U.S. and a lot of our products. So this is that kernel of wheat, and the white part there is the endosperm, and again, that's really where you find most of the starch and protein, um, and when you refine that grain, when we're removing the bran and germ, that's all that's left, and that's what's milled. Um, the bran then is where you find a lot of the fiber and in, um, the B vitamins and minerals that are in wheat naturally. And the germ is where you find um, a lot of the B vitamins and also a lot of the essential fatty acids. This is why the uh, whole wheat flour will go rancid a little bit faster than white flour because the germ in whole is still intact with whole wheat and that does... Um, have more of a tendency to go rancid since it is a fat. But we get most of our vitamins and minerals, phytochemicals, et cetera, in that germ and brand parts of our whole grains. And so when we're removing that to make a white flour or other products that we may make from um, refining the grain, uh, we lose a lot of those nutrients that are, are naturally in the food. So some things you can look for in foods. Um, Words like brown rice, oatmeal is normally was our whole grain. Um, you can see whole grain wheat, whole wheat, uh, whole grain corn, etc. Wheat in general 
it doesn't mean whole grain. And I know sometimes we talk about it that way it, or kind of assume with like white bread or wheat bread, right? So it may be, you know, we assume the wheat bread is 100% whole wheat and the white bread is not, but really the white bread is still made from wheat, right? So it's still a wheat bread product. And so you can't just tell that. Um, there used to be a product when I lived on the East Coast that was like a split top wheat and it looked like whole wheat bread. It was brown. They added a food coloring or like a molasses or something to it to make it look, um, you know, the color of our whole grain breads. And they called it split top wheat. And so everyone assumed that it was wheat, but or whole wheat, excuse me. And it was wheat, but it wasn't whole grain. Um, they just added that coloring to make it look that way. And so you have to kind of look for the whole grain or whole wheat, 100% whole wheat. Um, look at the ingredients list. Does it say, um, refined, what, what words do you see there? And you can see, you know, a 50% or more whole grain stamp, that means at least, you know, 50% or more of the grain in that product is whole grains. And it has a minimum of eight grams per serving. And then um, the 100% whole grain has that minimum of 16 grams per serving, but it is 100% of the grain in that product is whole grain. So just things to think about and look at um, we have to be a little bit careful in when we're looking through our food supply, how are things talked about, what what words are used. Sometimes it can be a little deceptive. So hopefully that gave you a, a brief overview of what to look for in whole grains and why it matters. Because And that and the recommendation is to get half your grains whole. It's not saying you have to eat all of your uh, grains that are whole grain. But we do get a lot more um, nutrients in our whole grain products. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about carbohydrate digestion. So in chapter three, we went over digestion as a whole, but carbohydrate digestion is not that much different, but in each of our um, macronutrient chapters, we'll talk about digestion again. So with carbohydrates, we break them down into the individual monosaccharides. So that is galactose, glucose, and fructose. So we have the enzymes, like we mentioned in chapter three, that are, are important for in, assisting in the digestion, so breaking down disaccharides. Lactose intolerance is one thing we talked about, where an individual may have low levels of lactase, which breaks down that lactose, and so it can cause GI symptoms. Again, this is not the same as a milk allergy. Those are different. Um, the milk allergy is the response to the protein in, a, in milk. Um, and there are a ton of lactose-free dairy alternatives that exist. Um, and some people with lactose intolerance can tolerate a different amount of dairy products than other people with lactose intolerance. So it's kind of an individualized thing we have to look at. Um, so we break it down into those glucose, fructose, and galactose. And we know that glucose is the uh, form that circulates in our blood. And so fructose and galactose can then be converted into glucose in our liver. And one quick point, we haven't really talked about resistant starch, but resistant starch, um, it has more fiber. So oatmeal, beans, nuts um, are digested more slowly and released over a longer period of time. And so we do think this uh, it acts differently than um, other carbohydrates may in how it affects our blood sugar, which we'll look at that in a minute as well. So this just break, shows you the picture, I'll let you go over it. Um, most of this is like what we talked about in chapter three with digestion. But you can look at this a little bit more um, to get some ideas of how starch digestion occurs. And you can see ultimately we're breaking those things down into individual amino acids. Carbohydrates are water soluble. So we can then just transport them in the capillary um, in our blood to the liver. So another topic with carbohydrates that's really important is added sugars. And we've mentioned this before, um, and we're, we're more concerned with added sugars and sugars naturally found in our food. Um, on average, Americans consume about 270 calories from added sugar every day. Um, this may increase the risk of dental caries, cavities um, in adults and kids. There's other potential risk factors as well. It can also be in lots of other names, and so that's one thing I really wanted to talk about. It could be fruit juice concentrate, or corn sweetener, or molasses, or maltose, high fructose corn syrup. And so all of those are added sugars, and so just things to look for on the label. The recommendation, if you remember, is to keep it less than 10% of your total calories from added sugar. So we can see, let's look at some of these, a 12-ounce soda 
has 132 calories from added sugar. A donut has 74. A um, couple of vanilla ice cream has 48 from, from added sugar. And um, peaches and heavy syrup has 115 of added sugar. And peaches is a really good example of something that canned peaches could have no added sugar, or it could be um, canned in juice, or it could be canned in a heavy syrup, which is going to have much more added sugar in it. So those are just things that you can look for when you're reading a label. And again, this isn't saying, you know, never have any treats or any added sugars or foods like that, but just being aware of what kinds of foods may have sugar added to it during processing. So, you know, what foods do you think contributed the most in the U.S. diet? So, by far, it's beverages. So, not including milk or 100% fruit juice, because we're not looking at those as added sugars. But this is where we can consume a large amount of added sugar in, in a short period of time, really, with our soft drinks, fruit-flavored drinks, energy drinks, coffee, tea, those kind of things that... Um, and again, coffee and tea by themselves don't have a lot of that, but when we're adding it to those types of beverages. Um, then next, is, and that makes up 47% of our added sugar, uh, followed by snacks and sweets. And then, you know, our dairy, grains, etc., make up a much smaller portion of the added sugar in the U.S. diet. So I think soft drinks is one uh, big area that we can look at and think about, you know, are we, are we, getting a lot of nutrition when we're adding large amounts of sugar like that into our body, or what's the nutrient density of that? So people always have questions about sugar alternatives, and we're not going to talk too much about that. I want to let you know what they are um, and, you know, some of the science behind them. There's a lot of uh, fear-mongering and scary talk about sugar alternatives, but there also may be some, some things that we don't know yet. So what do these mean? So nutritive sweeteners are things that are made from naturally occurring sugar in plants that are poorly absorbed. So we don't absorb them very well. So they do provide less um, calories than regular sugar. So these are things like sugar alcohols. Um, what we have to watch out for GI discomfort and other problems with sugar alcohols. So, um, you know, some of the, like, like sugar-free candy, you know, if you're like, woohoo, I got, someone gave me this whole box of chocolates and it's all sugar-free, so I'm just going to eat it all right now. Um, that may cause some, some GI discomfort and things like that. So we do need to um, watch the, the amount of those that are consumed if that's a trigger for someone. Um, Non-nutritive sweeteners then do not provide calories, and a lot of times they're way sweeter than sucrose. So you may, may, may need a much smaller amount. Um, I distinctly remember this from, you know, all the times I've had to fill sugar caddies when working in restaurants and things like that. So if you've ever done that, think about... Um, when you look at the, the sugar packet, so the real sugar compared to a lot of the artificial sweeteners, the real sugar packet is much um, bigger or just contains much more volume because the, uh, a lot of the alternative sweeteners are just way sweeter. So you need such a small amount in those. Um, they do fit better in the sugar caddies. Um, so I don't know if you've ever seen that, but look at that next time and just compare them. Um, these are regul regulated by the FDA. Um, they're generally recognized as safe if they're approved. Now, again, you know, there are studies and there are going to be experts who will argue on both sides of these things. That's why, you know, here I'm just presenting the information, letting you um, choose what you wish. But I think it's important to understand how some of the studies are done. And sometimes when we see studies about certain artificial sweeteners causing health problems in mice or rats, um, a lot of times the level of the sweetener that they use is just very unrealistic. So, you know, it may say if the, we are, we're putting this in human terms, you would have to consume, you know, 37 two liters of Diet Coke every day or something like that. And I just made that number up. But I've seen um, for different studies, diff you know, sometimes it, it looks um, very scary when you see that study. But then when we really kind of think about, well, how much did they give the animals and what would that translate to humans? And is that realistic or is anyone really consuming that much? Is that something to be concerned about? And so all of those things we have to think about when we're doing those studies and interpreting what those studies mean. So this just breaks down some of those um, nutritives. So up there you can see tegatose and then um, some of our sugar alcohols. And so you can see sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol um, used in some of our foods. Um, these can also be in naturally occurring, a little bit in naturally occurring foods as well. So think about that. Um, and then you can see how much sweeter some of these non-nutritive sweeteners are down there. Um, you know, sucralose is a common one, stevia, um, 
uh, aspartame, et cetera. Some of those are saccharin are common. Um, it's important to think about which one you're using for different things as well because like aspartame, for example, uh, is really not stable at um, baking temperatures. So we have to be careful with baking with that. Um, whereas something like Splenda is much more stable at baking temperatures, so it may be able to be substituted in, in baked goods. So that's just, you know, from a food science perspective, looking at those kind of things. Um, so again, you know, I think you have to do your research. There's a lot of um, kind of fear mongering out there um, and really see what is what do the studies really say about these things? Um, and there's some other thoughts on, you know, what what do they what role do they play in the microbiome? What role do they play in this? And, and we don't know we don't know all of that. Um, so I'll just leave that out there for you. But you know, you can kind of view this and see kind of what the the evidence currently says. All right, so let's get back to fiber. I really like fiber. The topic of fiber, I think, it's very interesting, um, and it definitely fits into the microbiome discussion like was talked about in the digestion chapter. So we have um, two main kinds of fiber that we talk about, and so soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. Insoluble, uh, like the name implies, dissolves in water to form a viscous gel that may help slow digestion, so it may help slow the rate of food emptying from the stomach into the small intestine that can maybe then also slow the absorption of, of nutrients and therefore decrease the spike to the blood sugar and things like that. Um, it's also thought to help lower blood cholesterol, which may help lower the risk of heart disease um, and may potentially be fermented by our good bacteria in our colon. Our insoluble fiber does not dissolve in water. Um, it does speed up transit time specifically in uh, later on in the um, GI system. And it adds bulk to stool, so it helps facilitate regular bowel movement. I think we mentioned sometimes when people are, are juicing and doing things like that, they kind of assume they'll have a lot of bowel movements, but sometimes they, don't, they have the opposite effect because they don't have that fiber to help facilitate those regular bowel movements, which we, we think is very important for digestive health. Um, we also further break it down into dietary fiber, which is... Uh, naturally occurring in the foods, and then functional fiber is basically those that fiber or non-digestible carbohydrates that are added to our foods. So that's really the difference between those two. Um, foods, you know, it's not like, sometimes we'll talk about oatmeal being soluble fiber or some other kinds of fiber being insoluble. I think of celery as a very good visual example of insoluble fiber. Um, but a lot of foods have both, right? So it's not just one or the other type of fiber. Um, so it's a combination of, of two types of fiber in that food. So again, we talked about the insoluble, uh, again, it's the dominant type. So most high fiber foods have a lot of insoluble fiber in them. And then our soluble fiber is what we really look at with like our whole grains. So especially oats, you know, we'll see that. Um, legumes are a really good source of that. Avocados, um, apples and pears are all really good source of soluble fiber as well. Um, and then you can see the dietary and, and uh, functional fiber definition. This food label also um, shows you how to find total fiber. Now it doesn't tell you the type of fiber, unfortunately, um, but what you can do, and some people do this, especially um, you know if they're dealing if they have diabetes and they are um, really tracking grams of carbs, etc. So if we had three grams of dietary fiber and twenty grams of total carbohydrate, I can sub subtract those three grams from the 20 and say I have kind of a net of 17 grams of carbohydrates that my body can digest and absorb. So I mean, most people aren't doing that on a regular basis, doing that math or needing to, um, but especially if someone is trying to dose insulin with type 1 diabetes or something like that, it can be uh, a good way to kind of accurately know how much of the carbohydrate we're digesting and absorbing. So this slide just gives some fiber content of some foods, and I think that's important to look at. So I wanted to keep it on here. I know it kind of looks funny on this slide, um, but I liked the, the diagram, so I went with it. Um, you can see some of our, our bread products up there, um, and you can see the difference between brown rice and white rice. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean that you always have to get brown or rice or, you know, et cetera. Um, you can see some of our cereals there that have a lot. Um, our beans tend to be really good sources, so black beans are really high on that as well. Um, for a half cup, 
our vegetables are a pretty good source. Um, but I do see this sometimes actually when, when people are, uh, you know, maybe on a diet that really restricts like grains and fruits and legumes, which some of our common popular diets out there do, and we won't name any names now, but we'll talk about them later. Um, but sometimes when that happens, you know, I see if people are truly of this list, they're really only eating vegetables, that they may have actually have a hard time getting their fiber recommendation. So it's great. I mean, broccoli and carrots are great. I love them. They're some of my favorite vegetables. I eat them on a regular basis. But I don't think I'm going to get all of my fiber just from eating them. So if I had, you know, a cup of broccoli, it'd be about five. If I had a cup of carrots, it'd be about five. So, you know, I'd be about, so if I had two cups of vegetables, maybe think I'm doing pretty good. And then I was really only at 10 grams of fiber. And for most of us, that's not near enough. And we'll talk about what we need. Um, but it's really more of a range from like 25 to 35, 38, depending on our size, gender, et cetera, and how much food we're eating. But, you know, so sometimes in that restriction of grains and legumes and fruits, um, we can really make it more difficult to meet our fiber needs. And so I've seen that sometimes people think, oh, it's okay, I'm eating my vegetables. Um, but they still may not be getting enough fiber. Fruits tend to be high, especially our raspberries. Raspberries are one of my favorites. Um, avocado is also really high. And so you can see that's comparing one cup of raspberries to half cup of avocado. So per cup, avocado has um, more even than, than raspberries would. So avocado is also a very good source of uh, our fiber as well. And this, there are also, uh, your other fruits and vegetables and things have fiber in them as well. It's not saying that they don't. They just are giving some examples of those as well. Um, but yeah, beans, avocado, those, um, some of our whole grains, those tend to be our really high sources of uh, fiber that's found in our food. So again, here's our recommendation. And I went ahead and um, put some other recommendations in here as well. So this is kind of a, a comprehensive slide. But for fiber specifically, you can see the adequate intake is about 14 grams per 1,000 calories of food consumed a day. And so they estimate, you know, women may need, you know, 25 grams a day. Men may need about 38 grams a day. It's just really going to depend. Um, on the individual, how many calories they need, etc. So it's kind of an estimation there for you. Um, when we look at total carbohydrates, the RDA is 130 grams a day, and that's based on brain function and brain use of glucose. And then our AMDR, or our um, adequate macronutrient distribution range, or acceptable, excuse me, macronutrient distribution range, is 45 to 65% of total calories. And so you can see where that breaks down a 2,000 calorie diet. That would be about 225 to 325 grams of carbohydrate per day. And again, it's going to depend. Everyone's, everyone's needs are different on that. Um, when it comes to added sugars, the dietary guidelines recommend less than 10% of total calories from added sugar. You can see one represents less than 25%. That's very high in my opinion. Um, the American Heart Association breaks it down into calories from that, and so it breaks it down into uh, women and men. But the World Health Organization aligns with the dietary guidelines, um, which is also less than 10% of energy intake for added sugars. All right, so we're going to transition a little bit to talk about diabetes. And you can find this information in the spotlight. So it's actually separated out. So Chapter 4 is specifically on carbohydrates, and then Spotlight A which is right after chapter four, uh, is uh, focusing on diabetes. And, and it fits to talk about diabetes at the same time that we are talking about carbohydrates. So diabetes is a group of diseases that can affect how our body uses, processes blood glucose. Um, it can be life-threatening if left untreated, and we'll talk about our three major types, so type one, type two, and gestational diabetes. So this map can be found in the... Uh, uh, sorry, it's on page 111 if you've got the printed version in the spotlight. Um, but it is a map that is showing the increase in the diabetes uh, predictions that they think, um, you know, between 2017 and 2045. So it's a little bit of prediction that we'll have diabetes worldwide. Um, and it breaks it down by region. So you can see, you know, in the U.S. and other parts of the world where they expect it to increase. 
Um, in the world overall, they expect it to increase about 48% between now or about now and 2045. So what is our, it's diabetes and blood glucose regulation in general. So we're going to talk a little bit about just what happens with blood glucose. So our, our levels of blood glucose in our, is normally pretty tightly regulated. So um, our normal fasting blood glucose is about 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. As we eat, naturally, our glucose levels are going to go up. Um, we have some hormones that uh, respond to this. So when you have glucose levels are rising, insulin is a hormone that's produced in the pancreas, the beta cells of the pancreas, that help your cells take glucose from the bloodstream to use. It promotes the storage of excess gluco glucose as glycogen. Um, it also helps promote the conversion of excess glucose to fat in liver and adipose tissue. So it really helps our cells take in glucose and use, but there's some thought about if we have um, really high levels of insulin because we're constantly having high levels of blood sugar that that may have um, some other concerns uh, as well. But insulin is a, a hormone that's really responding and helping our, our body cells use that glucose. Um, there's a really great uh, video that I have posted for you that's called, it's What is Diabetes? And it's actually done out of uh, the UK. And so um, you can hear the accent, but it um, does a really good job of explaining this as kind of a key and lock. So the way that they visualize it, and obviously that's not really what it looks like in our body, but is that insulin is like a key that can help open up the cell to allow, you know, open the door to allow the glucose to enter the cell. Um, so please watch that video. Uh, it's like, you know, 10 minutes, but it is really good at explaining and visualizing uh, really what is diabetes and how the blood sugar regulation occurs in our body. So when you haven't eaten in a few hours and your blood glucose level starts to drop, we have another hormone called glucagon that is produced in our pancreas that increases glucose in blood in response to low blood sugar. And so um, it can either break down that glycogen. Remember, we talked about glycogen as the storage form of glucose in um, animals or humans. Uh, so it can break down that glycogen to release some glucose, or it can make new glucose from amino acids or protein like we discussed before. So insulin and, and glucagon um, kind of balance each other out on that. So when you have high blood sugar, so it's showing, you know, you're eating a, a pasta meal, your blood sugar is going up, our pancreas can, um, you know, detect or in general hor hormones are sent, detects a, a rise in blood sugar. So insulin is secreted into our bloodstream. Um, you can see insulin stimulates the liver to synthesize more glycogen. It synthesizes uh, fat tissues to take up glucose and muscle to take up glucose to be used, and, and also um, for glycogen synthesis. So, you know, that's really regulating those blood glucose concentrations, et cetera. So that's what happens when glucose is high. Um, when we have low blood glucose, so since the last time we eat, it continues to go down. And when, when our body senses is, it's declining, and it's, you know, at the point where we need to intervene, it will release glucagon, which then signals the liver to break down the glycogen to produce glucose, and then again, maybe produce glucose from amino acids and release some of that sugar into our, our blood. So really, you know, our body is this finely tuned machine where we want to have things within a range. You know, we want our body temperature within a certain range. We want our pH within a certain range. We want our blood sugar within a certain range. And it will work hard um, to maintain those ranges. And so this is just another example of that. So what happens in type 1 diabetes? So type 1 is an autoimmune disease characterized by elevated levels of blood glucose. So um, really what's happening here is the cells in the pancreas, the beta cells that normally produce insulin, are destroyed. Um, we don't know why. We don't know what happens with autoimmune disease. Um, it, we don't consider type 1 diabetes preventable. Um, also, you know, we used to call it juvenile diabetes, but that doesn't necessarily really define what's happening because someone could get type 2 diabetes as a um, child or adolescent, and someone could also get a type 1 diabetes as an adult. And so it doesn't necessarily describe the process. And so really now we're, we're really calling them type 1 and type 2 to, to differentiate them. Um, this is, people often say that people with type 1 diabetes are born with it, and that's not the case um, in most cases. I know some, you know, the average age of diagnosis is anywhere, I've seen different stats, but, you know, 8 to 10 to 12, 
in that age. Um, I mean, you, I do know individuals who are diagnosed very young, and I do know individuals with type 1 who are diagnosed into their 20s or 30s. So um, it can happen at any time. Um, we don't know exactly, just like a lot of autoimmune disorders, we don't know exactly what's causing that. And there may be a genetic link, um, and there may be other environmental factors, etc. cetera. Um, and, but it, it's not normally like at birth someone has type 1 diabetes. Uh, this represents about 5 to 10% of individuals with diabetes. Your book will say, too, that they really think, especially worldwide, and when they look at the increase in prevalence, they're really looking more at type 2 with that. So it's a smaller percentage of individuals who have type 1 diabetes. And so it's in type 1, they're not producing insulin. And so their body doesn't have that help to remove the sugar from the blood, and blood sugar levels can become really high. Um, you may form ketones in this, um, and you guys may have heard of ketones in the ketogenic diet. Um, this is a little bit different. Ketogenic diet and ketoacidosis are different things. Um, but when we have hyperglycemia or higher than the normal blood glucose level, our body can synthesize ketones. So basically, you know, our body is having trouble getting the energy it needs because it can't get the glucose into the cells. And so ketones are th synthesized from fatty acids when insulin levels are low, so we don't have insulin present. And so that's the difference between someone who makes insulin who's on a ketogenic diet is not going to have the same effect of ketoacidosis as someone who is type 1 diabetes who really doesn't have insulin present. So those are the, the different, I mean, one of the ways it's a different mechanism. Our brain cells can use ketones for energy, um, but ketoacidosis can occur in these individuals when there's a lack of insulin, when you have excess ketone body formation, and that can actually be really dangerous, change, you know, alter our, our pH, um, and lead to coma and even death. So ketoacidosis and really high blood sugar is something we're very concerned about in individuals with type 1 diabetes, or, um, you know, it, look, it can look a little bit different. Type 2 can progress in some ways to have some of these same concerns, but just to keep it simple, we'll look at this primarily with a, a concern with type 1 diabetes. Um, you can also have a spillover of glucose into the urine. And so sometimes I've actually met some people who had um, kids who were diagnosed pretty, pretty young when they were still in diapers. And that was one way that their parents started to realize something was wrong is that they had very sweet smelling um, urine that seemed like there was like sugar in it. And so that was, you know, I, I had known someone who that was kind of their, one of their first signs um, that, that something was wrong with that. So that can happen as well. So high blood sugar in diabetes can be very dangerous. So type 2 diabetes is characterized by high blood sugar levels. So we sit, saw that same um, wording in type 1 diabetes. But this is more due to insulin resistance um, and maybe some impairment of insulin secretion. So they may have trouble secreting insulin, but a lot of times actually in the beginning of type 2 diabetes, um, that individual may actually even secrete more insulin to kind of make up for some of the insulin resistance. So an insulin resistance is where cells have a de decreased sensitivity to insulin, resulting in an Im impaired glucose uptake, which leads to high blood glucose. So um, on that video I was telling you about that describes insulin as the key to unlock the door to let the glucose in the cell, um, on their visual for type 2 diabetes, with type 1 they say, you know, you don't have the key. There's, there's no insulin, there's no key. In type 2 diabetes, they describe it as that key is, or that lock is, um, like, got a bunch of blockage in it, and so you can't get the key in. So you have the key, but you can't get the key in. And so that's, uh, I mean, that's a, you know, a visual, but I like that way to think about it. So again, please watch that video. Um, but that does lead to, um, you know, a similar thing where the cell, we've got insulin in a lot of cases, but the body can't use it efficiently. This is most of our diabetes cases that we see worldwide. Um, there are some risk factors, genetics, physical inactivity, diet, weight may play a role. So there's, there's different things that may affect the risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Um, and it's something that, you know, we can look at, and that's why they'll screen, you know, maybe we can look at, at pre-diabetes and, um, you know, which is, and I'll, we'll talk about that, but which is, you know, maybe where someone's blood glucose is elevated but not quite to the type 2 diabetes level and what can we do to help prevent that through lifestyle changes, um, et cetera. So here's showing you insulin sensitive, so normal blood glucose. 
Um, you know, you have the insulin binding signals, the cell allowing glucose to get in. And now this is more realistic of what's really happening than the lock and key, but I still like that um, analogy. So please look at that. But this is showing you what that looks like. In this case here, it's showing you the insulin's binding and insulin resistance, but that signal is weak. And so you really may not get as much glucose in or the, there may not be as much glucose transporters because the glucose transporters have to go into the membrane. And so if there's not as many of those present, then it's going to be more difficult to get the blood sugar out, the glucose out of the blood. And so there's going to be just more circulating blood glucose levels. So how do we diagnose type 2? So I mentioned prediabetes, and that's really a condition where the blood glucose is higher, but not quite high enough. And so I mentioned before that fasting blood sugar normal range is about 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. With uh, prediabetes, between about 100 and 125 milligrams per deciliter is where we see um, maybe a prediabetes concern. And then with diabetes, we typically look at fasting blood glucose greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter. Now you would never diagnose diabetes just on one single fasting glucose that's high. Um, there's other tests that we would do. So oral glucose tolerance tests that can be diagnosed. So basically it can give um, glucose and see how your body responds to that and over time to really do an official diabetes diagnosis. Um, there are some estimates that say about a third of adults over 20 in the US have prediabetes. And so it's definitely something to be concerned about um, when we're looking at our overall health. So this gives you a little bit more about um, the diagnosis. And so bear with me, I'm going to go through this with you. So patient one, uh, fasting blood glucose was, uh, you know, I don't know, 90, somewhere in between that 70 and 100. And you can see then with this um, glucose tolerance test that they're doing, so giving 75 grams of glucose and then measuring two hours later, but you can see what that is looking like with patient one. They can measure at different time points and seeing, you know, their um, glucose still goes up. When you eat, your glucose is still going up. That's a normal reaction to glucose. So they're, it's going up and then it's coming back down and the under 140 is where you want that two hour glucose level to be. And so you can see patient one hits both of those categories. Patient two's uh, fasting glucose is kind of borderline, right? Maybe 100, so borderline on that. Um, but then when we do the, the two-hour test, um, that diagnosis of prediabetes is kind of is confirmed because we, we see that that individual's blood glucose didn't come back down into that under 140 level where we would like it to be within two hours. And then for patient three, this would be a diagnosis of diabetes because we see a high fasting blood sugar, and then also a high um, two-hour uh, glucose tolerance test as well. And so that patient, we would be able to, in most cases, without other circumstances to say, has diabetes. And so that's just a, a, a way that we are able to test for that and think about uh, moving forward, you know, how, what the types of treatment can be recommended for these individuals. So gestational diabetes um, is actually pretty common. So about one in five pregnancies um, may have gestational diabetes. And so gestational diabetes is glucose developed during pregnancy. So if someone had, or sorry, diabetes developed during pregnancy, yes. If someone had diabetes before they got pregnant, it would not be considered gestational diabetes. Um, so again, most of these women will have normal blood glucose again after delivery, but there's a lot of hormonal changes and other things that occur during pregnancy. So it is just a higher risk. Um, and so we, it basically increases the risk of complications. And so this is just why we, we check for it, um, during pregnancy. That way, if someone does have it, because it is common, um, can have it better controlled. So they may be able to, you know, have some dietary exercise changes. Um, and it, it's fickle. Our body's responding to glucose and gestational diabetes differently than it does in other types of diabetes. Um, but, you know, if we do have uncontrolled di or gestational diabetes in general, we can see higher um, risk of, um, you know, needing a C-section or high blood pressure during pregnancy, um, risk of breathing problems and other concerns for the child as well. So, you know, there's, a, there's just things we want to do to control that if um, we think gestational diabetes is a risk factor for this individual as well.
So this slide gives some overall complications of diabetes um, for all, you know, this is kind of all types of diabetes we're talking about, specifically type uh, 1 and type 2. Um, with type 2, some of these are, are symptoms. So, you know, sometimes someone may feel like their vision is changing and maybe that is a sign that they're developing type 2 diabetes, etc. But, you know, some things increases the risk of stroke uh, and, and definitely plays a role in kidney failure, um, can damage nerves and blood vessels, which is why sometimes individuals need to have uh, parts of, especially feet, toes, etc., amputated because, you know, they may have a harder time feeling cuts, um, their wounds may not heal as well in the extremities, etc. Um, can, like we said, can affect uh, vision, blindness, increases risk for heart disease, etc. So, you know, this is why we're looking at um, tight control of diabetes as important in a public health setting. So what are the treatments? So with type 1 diabetes, they require insulin, so shots or via an insulin pump. And so you can see an insulin pump right there. Um, and then with uh, the, the top picture is of a glucometer, so a way to check blood glucose. And so an individual needs to check blood glucose multiple times a day. Um, and then a lot of times they'll dose insulin based on what they're eating and what their glucose says. Uh, there have been a lot of advances in the type 1 treatment, and so there are things like continuous glucose monitors that they can wear. Um, there are, um, you know, that can communicate with the pump, can communicate with cell phones. So there's lots of different advancements in treatment of type 1, but it is definitely something that um, must be monitored very closely. Type 2 often don't need insulin at start. Um, they may start with oral medication like metformin, if you've heard of that, is a really common medication that's given early on in type 2 diabetes. Um, they may also recommend a carb-controlled diet. Um, again, that's not eating no carbs, um, but losing weight, physical activity level, um, things like that to help that. So, you know, there's, there's some things we can look at with carbohydrates and how they affect our blood sugar that are relevant for diabetes. Now, just before we go into this caveat, um, some people have gone to like, oh, everyone on diabetes, then obviously should just cut out all carbs, and so should eat ketogenic and do all this. And um, there's not a lot of research on that, and I've actually seen some research recently that's kind of suggested, hey, wait, maybe some of those diets actually have a negative effect on some of these disease states, so maybe don't do that. So there's, there's a lot of research being done, and we need to be careful with those. Um, but uh, we do know that foods, uh, even with the same amount of total carbohydrates, you can see kidney beans versus new potatoes, may happen a different effect on our blood sugar. And so this is what we're using when we talk about glycemic index or glycemic load to how um, those foods really raise blood, blood glucose level. So potatoes, new potatoes are going to um, raise blood glucose faster than kidney beans, which have a lot of the resistant starch and fiber in them. So a lot of times we'll use a tool called carb counting um, to track carbohydrates um, so the individual can kind of estimate instead of having to exactly read every label or um, anything like that or foods that don't have labels, um, can kind of estimate the amount of carbs are in a meal and track that to, uh, you know, balance out eating a, a, a more consistent level of carbohydrates throughout the day, et cetera. And we do talk more about that in other classes. This is just showing a glycemic index as well. So low glycemic index, um, you know, and milk chocolate bar, woohoo. So sometimes high sugar foods actually have a low GI because your body needs to convert fructose to glucose, um, which slows down it coming into it as, as that. Um, you can see brown rice is kind of um, medium. Uh, GI on that compared to white rice, which is high GI, but it's not that different, really. They're pretty similar. Um, and then our um, high starch contents often, like potato, tends to be broken down pretty rapidly, so it may have a high glycemic index. And, and sometimes these are things that we want to look at in terms of, you know, how these foods affect our body. This isn't used necessarily, like, you know, it's the end-all be-all. Like, I'm not saying that chocolate cake is healthier than eating a sweet potato, you know, because one's low, one's high. That's, that's not really what that's saying, which is why you see how it gets kind of 
complicated. And when people just take one piece of the nutrition puzzle and blow that up and talk about it, they're missing, you know, the bigger picture of how these foods fit into an overall diet. So the last thing I want to mention in terms of diabetes is hypoglycemia. Um, and so we can see things like reactive hypoglycemia or fasting hypoglycemia where people have, have low levels of, of um, blood glucose. And reactive is, you know, after somebody eats a large amount of carbs, it kind of causes that big release of insulin and rapid blood sugar drop. And so this can be seen um, in some individuals who, you know, don't have diabetes when they have this concern with digesting carbohydrates. Um, we can also see really low fasting blood sugar or anything like that in individuals with diabetes, especially type 1, um, or those taking too much, sometimes taking too much insulin or other medications can actually cause the blood glucose levels to go down too far as well. And just like really high blood sugar that can theoretically lead to coma and death, really low blood sugar in someone, especially with type 1 diabetes, could do the same thing. And so some symptoms like anxiety, irritability, hunger, sweating, all those things um, are things we have to watch out for. So, um, you know, when someone has low blood sugar, really low blood sugar, especially with type 1, you know, sometimes the best thing to do is, is just a quick sugar. So sometimes whether that's orange juice or even a little, you know, four ounces of soda or um, sometimes they'll talk about icing, like the gel icings as something that you could put in someone's mouth if they can't swallow. So there's lots of things that can be done in those cases. Um, but it is something to take seriously, just like high blood sugar. So again, we just kind of scratched the surface in uh, diabetes uh, prevention treatment, what the diseases are all about. So hopefully you have a little better understanding of what that looks like and carbs overall. Um, there will be some readings and videos to watch. Don't forget to read the chapter in the book and um, hopefully it'll give you even better understanding. Let me know if you have any questions.